there's a killer stuck in the streets of Rome in today's movie. And man, it's a real drag. <laughs> Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're covering Dario Argento's classic giallo film, Deep Red. Released in 1975, Deep Red is arguably Argento's first masterpiece. While the filmmaker's first three gialli, commonly referred to as the Animal Trilogy, are all fantastic, Deep Red is the birthing point of the distinctive visual style fans have come to equate with Argento's work. This is the first Argento feature to really embrace the crazy camera movements and the over-the-top murder set pieces the filmmaker is known for. It's also the first time Argento would collaborate with Goblin and Daria Nicolodi. Both would have a profound influence on his work moving forward. And while all that's great, I think I know what you guys really want to know about this movie. Is Deep Red splattery? Let's get to the gore and find out. We fade in on the credits. Here's David Hemmings making his first Sick Flicks appearance. And the return of Daria Nicolodi. Nicolodi passed away in 2020. It's impossible to understate how important a role she played in Argento's cinema. As a muse, a co-collaborator, and an influence, it's safe to say that Argento's golden era might not have been as amazing without Nicolodi's presence. Her passing was a huge loss for horror fans. And music by Goblin. This was the first of many collaborations between Argento and the Prog Rockers, and Deep Red remains one of their best scores. With the credits over, we swing by this house to celebrate Christmas. It looks very festive. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to carve the turkey, not your husband. Then this kid's like, a bloody knife, awesome. How did Santa know? We then hop over here to an impromptu mausoleum jam session. Unfortunately, David Hemmings here isn't happy with it. It stinks. And while he's busy conducting a lecture on jazz history, we hop over to this parapsychology conference. Termites, zebra. All these animals, and many, many others, use telepathy. And yeah, if you listen to that and think, hey, Argento was laying the groundwork for phenomena here, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. Also, is it just me, or does this dude kind of look like a chubby Barry Gibb? Ernest Hemingway here is like, boring. Wonder if I can get Lawrence Welk on this thing. Anyway, the point of all this jibber-jabber is so we can meet noted psychic Helga Ullman. Mrs. Ullman. I would like to point out immediately. Helga does some basic ESP work for the crowd, but then things get weird. No! Hey! Get out! Get out! Ah! Ah! Even the camera's like, yeah, too weird for me. I'm out. Meanwhile, over here in the bathroom from the first Saw movie, this guy's like, well, I think we can all agree that went great. Not awkward at all. Also, does no one ever clean this restroom? Where's the little sign-in sheet? I'm gonna have to speak to a manager. After the show, Helga drops this bombshell. I couldn't express all the sensations that flooded my mind. But at home, I want to write it all down. Yeah, sure, just write it down. Don't go to the cops or anything. I mean, especially since the killer is watching you. Back at her place, she's on the phone. Hello, police? I'd like to report a murder. Mine. It just hasn't happened yet. I'm psychic, though, so trust me on this. And it turns out she was right, as the killer barges in and butchers her with a cleaver. <laughs> Meanwhile, David Hemmings is walking right past this live-action version of Edward Hopper's famous Nighthawks painting before stopping by for drinks with Art Garfunkel. You know, friend. He you know. After they talk shop, Mark continues his walk, but that's interrupted by a murder. Rather than call the cops, he barges into Helga's apartment and walks right past an important clue you'll see later. This is why he's a pianist and not a detective. Later that evening, Mark gets interrogated by the cops. Wait, are they gonna drink coffee out of those tiny cups or take urine samples? If you find yourself thinking, hey, wasn't Daria Nicolodi supposed to be in this movie? Well, here you go. Qui non puoi entrare. E perché no? In un delitto di questa portata, la prima cosa è avvertire. Gianna here is a reporter, and she's probably a better detective than this cop. You. I bet you're the eyewitness. The man who saw the whole thing. After the interrogation, Mark's back to talking to Art Garfunkel. This giant in the background is like, Hey, it's 4am, can you guys keep it down? I'm trying to sleep here. But there is one important bit of information here. 
I, I thought I saw, I, I thought I saw a painting. And then, a, a few minutes later, it was gone. Foreshadowing. The next day, Mark attends the funeral with Gianna because that's the most convenient way to drop in some exposition. You see him, the one in the Mac, that's Giordani. He's a professor of psychiatry, but he's also mad about parapsychology. You could say they're really digging up the dirt on Helga. After the funeral, she takes Mark out for a ride. Dude's gonna need a booster seat. <gasps> oh, I should have warned you about that seat. I'm sorry. Are you uncomfortable? Nah. Meanwhile, over here, Chubby Barry Gibb has his new Bee Gees cover band getting ready for their first concert. I think we should open with staying alive. Turns out, these guys are actually reconstructing the conference events for Gianna and Mark. I said, what kind of movement? I think someone stood up and left his seat. Told you she was better than the cops. Afterwards, Mark offers up his gender studies lecture for us. It is a fundamental fact. Men are different from women. Women are weaker. Gianna calls bullshit and challenges him to arm wrestle. Man, when did this movie turn into over the top? At any rate, it appears being a jazz pianist is not a good way to build arm strength. <laughs> Mark needs to do more curls. For the next step in his investigation, Mark heads over to see Art Garfunkel, but runs into the guy's mother instead. Sorry, Art's not home now. He's off somewhere with that short guy, Paul. She sends him on his way, and at his next stop, he finds Carlo is hanging out with his cross-dresser. I'm looking for Carlo. Um, his mother gave me this address. Is he here? Yes, yes. Come in. Outside, Mark and Carlo talk some more. And could Carlo be our killer? Anyone who'd commit a crime like that... is sick. Are you trying to tell me something, Carlo? Back at Mark's place, he's being stalked. Oh wait, that's just the camera. Man, even the camera is creepy in this movie. Anyway, looks like he must be writing an early version of Lionel Richie's Dancing on the Ceiling, judging by this shot. Stop hanging around up there. But it turns out he is being stalked, because someone's creeping through his house and whispering sweet nothings to him from the other side of this door. This time you're safe. Hello? I'll kill you anyway. Hello? Sooner or later. Oh, and they leave him this creepy cassette. The next day, Mark takes it to Chubby Berry Gibb. Look, Mark, your demo is nice, but it's not very disco-y. I'm gonna have to pass. Kidding aside, Mark is actually here for some psychological profiling. Turns out this killer is crazy. The murder is a schizophrenic paranoid. Who knew? But this guy does offer up one useful tidbit, send a Mark to find this book of folklore to learn about a haunted house. I think the title was The Modern Ghost and the Black Legends of Today. With a new lead, we jump over here to Amanda Rigetti's place. And I got a bad feeling about this. A hanging baby doll is generally not a good omen. Naturally, the smart thing to do is head right out to this totally dark room. Hello? Killer? Are you in here? I'm ready to be murdered now. And there's another hanging baby doll in here. Starting to think this lady made some weird design choices in this home. She doesn't seem too bothered by it, but here comes the creepiest shot in the movie so far. Yeah, there's some nightmare fuel for you. And then you know it's murder time because the killer fires up their soundtrack. I'm not sure this is what Nick Cave had in mind when he wrote murder ballads. Amanda isn't going down without a fight though. She grabs this knitting needle, but too bad for her, the killer's sneaking up behind her. Amanda's a bloody mess at this point, so the killer's gonna clean her up with a nice bath. You could say she's in hot water. Also, even at death, Amanda was smoking hot. Argento and co-writer Bernardino Zapponi selected their murder set pieces in this film with an eye toward practicality. Most people have no idea what it feels like to be stabbed, but we've all burnt ourselves at one time or another. Because of this, they felt the audience would have a more visceral reaction to Deep Red's kills. Mark shows up right after the killing and immediately demonstrates why he flunked out of Dance Academy. Dude's got two left feet. After finding Amanda's body, he's back to square one in terms of finding the haunted house from the book. Which means it's time for a montage. After driving aimlessly through Italy, he finally finds the house. What are the odds? Oh right, pretty high. I mean, we gotta keep the plot moving. And, as luck would have it, the place is for rent. So, Mark goes to meet the caretaker, voiced by, you guessed it, Edward Mannix. 
That house used to belong to a guy called Schwartz. Mannix is here not only to take us on a tour of the home, but provide some exposition too. Turns out the previous owner died horribly. How did he, uh, how did he die? It was an accident. Poor bastard. He fell out of a window. Meanwhile, Professor Giordani, a.k.a. Chubby Barry Gibb, is over here investigating Amanda's death. Do the cops actually do anything in this movie? The maid shows him where the body was found, and then things start getting steamy. Literally. As Giordani finds the note Amanda left in the condensation. Too bad it's a dead end, too. With that settled, we head over for an episode of House Hunters International as young Olga takes Mark for a walk through the house. But first, Dad gives her a taste of his pimp hand. I told you not to do that again. <laughs> Man, that's a creepy face. And if it looks familiar, it's because that's Nicoletta Elmi, who grew up to be the ticket taker lady in Lamberto Bava's Demons. Turns out she's a fledgling serial killer who likes to torture lizards. And just take my word for it. Anyway, Mark heads inside. Clearly, this place is going to need a full reno. He skulks around the place like this is one of those Urban Explorer YouTube channels, and then discovers this. <laughs> Guess he's just gonna start the reno himself. And what has he found? If you guessed a creepy mural of that Christmas murder that opened the movie, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. I bet you guys forgot about that sequence, didn't you? Unfortunately, his excavation is interrupted when the caretaker shows up. But we watch as this happens. Dun dun dun. We then hop over to Professor Giordani's house, where the killer's about to drop in for a visit. This leads us to another of Deep Red's most memorable scenes. The professor's armed himself, but he's startled by this weird puppet thing that comes running into the room. <laughs> Um, what the hell is that thing? And yeah, it seems like Saw definitely drew some inspiration for Jigsaw's Billy Puppet from Deep Red. Giordani's not afraid of a freaky looking puppet though. I love that it has little death spasms. Too bad for him the automaton was just a distraction because the killer beans him with a fire poker. Then bashes his teeth in on the corner of this desk. Hope Giordani knows a good dentist. And really, a knife to the neck seems like a reprieve after all that. After learning that Giordani is dead, Mark's finally decided that maybe playing detective isn't so much fun after all. He's gonna get out of town, but first he returns to the haunted house. Because sure, that seems like a great idea. And what has brought him back here, you may be asking? The window. And he just climbs up there and starts tearing out the wall right in the middle of the night. I'm sure the neighbors won't mind all that banging. After nearly falling to his death, he heads back inside and finds another fake wall. What's in there? Oh, just that Christmas tree and table from the opening. And this mummified corpse. Someone forgot to unwrap Dad. He's shocked. So shocked he backs right up into a blow to the head. Nice work, Mark. When he comes to, Gianna has found him. Could she be the killer? Before we can figure that out, look, the house is on fire. So I rushed upstairs and found you lying near the flames. Or more accurately, a photo of the house is on fire. That is one dodgy looking effect, Dario. While they're busy calling the fire department, Mark spots this familiar looking drawing on the caretaker's daughter's wall. Who gave you this? After some interrogation, she sends them off to a nearby school. I... I saw the school. Man, Mark's great at breaking into places. Dude might have a career as a cat burglar if the whole pianist thing doesn't work out. They head for the archives and find all the old drawings. No, no, these are terrible. These aren't even worthy of hanging on my fridge. Jonna heads off to use the phone, but they're not alone. Jonna. When she doesn't come back, Mark heads off to find her, only to discover she's been stabbed. Mark, help me. Mark knows who the killer is, and they play a little cat and mouse in the empty school. You know who it is? Yes, I know. 
And surprise, it's Carlo. I read the name. Carlo. He's about to send Mark up the stairway to heaven, but the cops, who've been totally in effect of all movie, finally show up. Carlo makes his escape and runs right into this garbage truck and gets caught on it and dragged around before this car runs over his head. And that's the end of the movie, right? Well, not so fast. Gianna's gonna pull through, but while Mark is walking through the city, he finally remembers the thing that's been bugging him all movie. He was with me when Helga was killed. He heads back to Helga's apartment and it finally clicks. There never was a painting there at all. What I saw was a reflection in a mirror. Yep, he walked right past the killer in the first scenes. And it's Carlo's mom. She confronts Mark and we can finally put all the puzzle pieces in their place. Carlo's parents are debating about sending her back to a hospital when she goes off the deep end and buries this knife in Dad's back right in front of little Carlo. No wonder dude was an alcoholic. Back in the present, there's one last kill. She needs to finish off Mark. Too bad for her, she gets her necklace caught in the elevator and it decapitates her. She really lost her head over the death of her son. Deep Red is basically the starting point of Argento's golden era. It's a masterful giallo that highlights all of the things that make Argento's cinema so unforgettable. But can Germano Natale and Carlo Rambaldi serve up enough splatter to earn this one five barf bags? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Deep Red delivers. We're treated to one brutal knifing, death by scalding, that gruesome teeth mashing, a crushed skull, and a decapitation. While Deep Red isn't quite as gory as later Argento fare, there are enough memorable kills here to earn it a solid three barf bag rating. This is definitely a sick flick. Looking for more Argento gore? Then be sure to check out my review of Phenomena. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.